Hi, and welcome to ETF Fundamentals, how ETFs work and what hidden risks really exist, the latest in a series of educational webinars developed by IndexUniverse.com. My name is Matt Hogan, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. For those of you who don't know me, I'm President of ETF Analytics and Global Head of Editorial for Index Universe. We are one of the leading independent authorities on ETFs in the world, producing publications like Index Universe and the Exchange Traded Funds Report, and running the largest ETF-focused conf conferences in both the U.S. and Europe. I'm very excited about today's webinar. ETFs have grown so quickly over the past few years that few have taken the time to truly understand how they work. There are investors with billions of dollars invested in ETFs who don't understand the basic structural principles governing these funds. More importantly, there are a lot of misperceptions and outright distortions in the market about the potential risks and benefits of ETFs, and we're going to tackle those head on in the next hour. The format for today's webinar is simple. I'll start by reviewing the basics of how ETFs work, including how the creation redemption process drives both the core benefits and core risks of exchange traded funds. And then we'll poke some holes in the wrong headed claims made about ETFs in the broader media while also digging into some of the true risks that really do exist in the ETF market. After I give my 30-minute presentation, I'll bring in my panelists. I've arranged a special treat today, bringing in two of the top minds in ETF land for what should be a fun and exciting Q&A. We're joined today by Tom Lydon, founder of ETFtrends.com and a great financial advisor himself. ETF Trends has been one of my go-to websites on ETFs for years, and Tom just keeps making it better. Tom is also co-manager with me and Jim Lowell of the CNBC ETF portfolios. Uh, joining Tom and I on the call is Michael Johnston, co-founder of ETF Database, better known by its URL, ETFDB. Michael has a great website that organizes core ETF information in a user-friendly format, and I recommend his website heavily. Uh, I want to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. As a participant in this webinar, you can submit questions for me or my panelists at any time during the presentation by entering them into the Q&A window on your screen. We'll collate those questions and answer as many as we can at the end. Also, a replay of this presentation and a copy of the slides will be available at indexuniverse.com within a few days. For those of you who are viewing this live, information on how to apply for CE credits will be contained in that follow-up email. And with that, let's get started. An ETF, and I, I think this is very important, is really just a special kind of mutual fund. It's structured like a mutual fund, managed like a mutual fund, and regulated like a mutual fund. But importantly, it's a mutual fund with a twist, which is hinted at by the name, Exchange Traded Fund. An ETF is a mutual fund that trades on an exchange like a stock. But in a traditional mutual fund, all investor buy and sell transactions take place once per day at one price after the close of trading on the NYSE. With an ETF, you can buy and sell it just like you would IBM, Cisco, or any listed stock. You can also do all the things with ETFs that investors love to do with stocks, but they've never been able to do with mutual funds such as use options or margins. So why should you care? Uh, next slide, please. Two slides ahead. Why should you care? Why does the simple act of putting a mutual fund on an exchange matter to investors? Because all the advantages and disadvantages that when we think about when we think of ETFs are driven precisely by this fact. Whether you're talking about good things like intraday trading, lower cost, tax efficiency, or transparency, or bad things like the flash crash, settlement failures, premiums and discount. These things don't happen by chance. They're all driven by the fact that these are exchange traded funds. And if you take the time to understand how ETFs function and how they're allowed to trade on an exchange, you'll understand the source of these benefits and risks and be able to explain them to your clients. So to explain how ETFs work, I actually want to start way back at the beginning with mutual funds and imagine that you're creating the very first mutual fund in the world. Let's suppose that you and three of your friends have each have $10,000 to invest, but you don't have the time or the inclination to invest that money yourself, so you decide to pool it and hire a professional manager to run it for you. 
to keep track of who has invested what in each fund, the fund will issue shares. Let's say it gives each of you 100 shares worth $100 each. The manager will then take that money and go to put it to work in the market. He'll buy $40,000 of stock. Let's say that he blows the doors off and doubles the money, taking it from forty dollars to $80,000. All of a sudden, your shares are worth $200. If he messes up and loses half the money, the shares are worth 50 bucks instead. The beauty of the system is because the shares in the fund are just notional units. Investors can come and go at any time. If your cousin wants to join the fund, all he has to do is send the fund however much money he wants to invest, and the fund will issue him shares at whatever the current value is. The manager then takes that money and goes and puts it to work in the market, just like he did with the original money. Now, we all know, of course, that in reality, investors don't launch their own mutual funds. They buy shares in existing funds, like Fidelity Magellan or Janus 20. But the process works essentially the same. Sometime during the day, you decide to buy shares in a mutual fund. You place a buy order, either directly with the fund company or through your brokerage account, and the money is transferred from you to the fund company. What happens next? Well, at first, nothing. In fact, nothing at all happens until 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Then the fund will add up its assets and its shares outstanding and figure out how much each share is worth, what's called the net asset value of the fund. Then it has some serious work to do. It takes your money, calculates how many shares your $10,000 will buy, writes down who you are, sends you shares, mails you a prospectus, staffs a phone bank to answer your questions, and more. And the next morning, it has even more work to do. Then the manager has to take your $10,000 and go into the market and buy securities, incurring any trading costs or slippage along the way. And if you decide to sell, the whole process reverses itself. An ETF works a little bit differently. When you buy shares of an ETF, you simply enter a buy order into your brokerage account, just like you would a regular stock. You take a look at the market, you see a bid and an ask price, and your broker executes the trade. Somewhere on the other side, another investor decides to sell you those shares. Now think about what doesn't happen in this transaction. First of all, you don't have to wait until 4 p.m. to have your order processed. You can trade at 10 a.m. or 12.30 or 3.30. You can buy the ETF at 10 a.m. and sell it at 11 and buy it again at noon if you want to. Secondly, and most importantly, you don't have any interaction in this process with the ETF company at all. There's no sending them money. There's no them writing down who you are or how many shares you own or sending you a prospectus. And in this case, there's no fund managers going into the market to buy securities. In fact, look at this slide. The ETF company isn't even mentioned. At this point, the ETF company doesn't even know you exist. You've bought your shares from another investor. Now, you might ask how the money ends up in the hands of the ETF company so it can buy stocks and investments, and that's the key to understanding how ETFs work. So as with mutual funds, the best way to understand how an ETF works is to understand how the very first shares of an ETF are created. The problem with starting an ETF, which I'm sure some of you have already realized, is that you can only buy shares in an ETF from another investor, so how can you possibly buy the first shares of an ETF? It's a classic chicken and egg problem. The answer, and this is the important piece, is that there's a group of institutional investors called authorized participants, or APs for short, who are quote unquote authorized to create shares of an ETF. So before a new ETF launches, one of these APs will enter into an agreement to create a basket of ETF shares, typically 100,000 shares priced at $25 each. Then, they do something a little bit different. Rather than simply sending the ETF company $2.5 million in cash and requiring it to buy securities, the APs will go into the market and buy up all the individual stocks that the ETF wants to hold. If it's an S&P 500 ETF, for instance, the AP will buy up all the individual stocks in the S&P 500, and then they'll ship those to the ETF company in exchange for ETF shares. The system works beautifully. The ETF company gets the exposure it wants, and the AP gets the shares that it needs to sell on the open market. Importantly, this process continues for the entire life of an ETF. 
Whenever an AP senses that there is excess demand for an ETF in the market, it can create more shares working directly with the fund company. The process can also work in reverse. If at any point an AP senses that there are too many shares of an ETF in the market, it can redeem those shares with the issuer. The way this works is simple. The AP will buy a quote-unquote basket of ETF shares in the open market, typically 50 or 100,000 shares, and then they'll trade them into the ETF issuer. In exchange, the ETF issuer will give the AP back that security basket, all the individual stocks or bonds held in the ETF, which the AP can then sell on the open market. So why be an AP? Well, the answer is simple, to make money. Here's a slide that shows what you would imagine an ETF trading in perfect supply and demand equilibrium. The price of the ETF on the open market is just a tiny bit above the fair value of all the securities inside the ETF. That tiny bit is the spread. If you wanted to sell this ETF, the price would probably be $49.99. And in markets like this, the AP does nothing. There's the right number of shares. But what if everyone wants to buy an ETF all at once? Well, then the price goes up. Let's suppose that a huge rush to buy pushes the price of the ETF to $52 a share, while the fair value stays at $50. That's called trading at a premium. An AP will see this premium develop, and when the discrepancy gets large enough, he'll create more shares by buying the underlying stocks, just as we described earlier. The beauty of this is that it pushes the ETF back into equilibrium. The AP goes out into the open market and buys all the underlying securities that make up a creation unit of the ETF, then simultaneously sells that number of ETF shares on the open market. The sale of that big block of ETF shares puts downward pressure on the ETF's price, and the purchase of the underlying securities puts upward pressure on the stocks themselves. That will cause this teeter-totter to even out. Brings it all back into balance. Meanwhile, the AP has just made two bucks in a more or less riskless trade, making being an AP a very good business. Fortunately, there are a lot of APs out there all playing this game, so it only takes the slightest premium to show up in most ETFs before an AP will pounce. More often than not, they're booking a few pennies and not a few dollars, so most of the time ETFs stay priced near fair market value. And of course, it works the opposite way. When the ETF trades to a discount, the AP will buy shares of that ETF and sell the underlying securities. At the end of the day, he'll return the ETF shares to the ETF issuer and get the underlying securities basket in return, balancing out his book and balancing out this teeter-totter as well. So all that's a little bit in the weeds, but it's critically important because that creation redemption mechanism drives all of the major benefits and all of the true major risks that exist in the ETF market. So let's think about those benefits. The first one, the first benefit that everyone turns to is intraday trading. And the reason that ETFs have been so successful and closed-end funds, for instance, have not is precisely because this creation redemption system works so well and keeps ETF trading close to fair market value all day. That's what traders like, and that's why ETFs have been so successful. Most people understand that. But not everyone understands that the creation redemption mechanism also drives the lower cost of ETFs. Now, there are a lot of reasons why ETFs cost less than most mutual funds, starting with the fact that most ETFs are index funds, and index funds are inherently cheaper to manage than active products. But ETFs are even cheaper than traditional mutual funds, and the reason ties back to that creation process. Remember all the things that happened when we bought shares of that mutual fund? First, the fund company had to write down who we were, and then they staffed a phone bank, and they sent us a prospectus, and they hired managers to put our money to work, and they incurred slippage and trading costs. Now think about what happens when you bought that ETF. You placed an order in your brokerage account, and, and well, that's about it. No prospectus, no phone bank, no putting money to work. Of course, I'm generalizing here. ETF companies still staff management teams and have certain delivery requirements and definitely manage the ETF on a day-to-day -day basis, but the concept is right. It costs ETF companies less money to run ETFs than it does to run mutual funds, and those savings pass on to customers.
I'll turn to the next one, tax efficiency. You hear a lot about the tax efficiency of ETFs and how rarely they pay capital gains distributions, and that's unequivocally true. I think last year about five of the 219 iShares ETFs paid any distributions at all, which is a record that would make most large mutual fund companies swoon. But very few people ask why ETFs are so tax efficient, and the reason ties right back to this creation redemption process. Again, think about what happens when you redeem shares from a mutual fund. You ask for your $10,000, and the manager has to go into the market and sell some securities to pay you. If those securities have appreciated since they bought them, they incur capital gains. In an ETF, when you sell your shares, you just sell them to another investor. The ETF company doesn't have to sell anything out of its portfolio at all to meet your personal redemption. But there's another, more important benefit. When there's excess demand for an ETF and an AP redeems shares, when they cash in shares, the ETF manager can actually choose which underlying shares of stock it delivers back to the AP in the redemption basket. And because ETF companies are smart, they choose the shares with the largest embedded capital gains. Therefore, with this constant redemption process, they're constantly cleaning themselves of potential capital gains. And that's why you see ETFs with very few unrealized capital gains and almost never paying out capital gains distributions. So let's turn to benefit four, transparency. Now most people think ETFs are fully transparent. And while that's not actually true, we can dig into that in the Q&A, uh, not all ETFs disclose their holdings on a daily basis. ETFs are much more transparent than mutual funds. And the reason, again, is that creation redemption process. ETF companies must disclose the basket of shares needed to process creation redemptions on a daily basis. And typically, that basket offers a fair representation of the fund itself. It's a huge advantage over mutual funds where you only get a peek into their holdings quarterly and then only with a significant lag. And the final key here to ETFs is access. There are now more than 1,100 ETFs on the market, 232 launched last year, and 800 more are in the pipeline. And all of these exist because the creation redemption mechanism is robust enough to provide exposure to almost any asset class. So let's turn to risks. Are ETFs perfect? Uh, of course not. You know, we've just talked about all the ways that ETFs are lower cost and more tax efficient than mutual funds, but I guarantee you that on May 6th of last year, uh, no one was particularly happy to be in ETFs. Uh, that was the flash crash day, of course, and you can see on this chart what happened to the Ridex Equal Weight S&P 500 ETF, RSP. RSP wasn't alone. There were 200 some odd ETFs that this happened to. Um, but they were trading along happily until 245, and then wham, they fell to zero. Now, a mutual fund wouldn't have looked like this. It would have looked like a solid line across the entire screen because it doesn't trade any intraday. There was no flash crash in mutual funds because they only price once per day after the close of trading. But with an ETF, well, you ran into an issue. Now, ETFs were disproportionately affected by the flash crash. They accounted for 70% of the securities that had trade canceled that day because they dropped more than 60% in price. So they, they were uniquely affected. And the reason, again, ties back to how ETFs are structured. Remember that APs and high-frequency trading shops are always watching ETFs and comparing their share price with the underlying net asset values. They're always doing that arbitrage we showed earlier. Now imagine you get a bad price in one stock that is widely held by ETFs. Let's say Procter & Gamble or IBM or Cisco. All of a sudden, all the ETFs that hold Procter & Gamble or IBM or Cisco look overvalued. And the machines that monitor those prices jump on that mispricing and they sell the ETFs to push them back towards what they're seeing as fair value. So that is true. ETFs are uniquely exposed to that kind of algorithmic flash crash. Now, the circuit breakers that have been put in place should help mitigate this in the future, but it does point out you're dealing with exchange-traded instruments, and that introduces new risks compared to mutual funds. A related issue, and perhaps the most obvious challenge to ETFs, is commissions. While certain companies like Schwab, Vanguard and others now often commission-free trading to brokerage customers for some ETFs. 
Many investors still have to contend with commissions before they can buy and sell. That may not matter much if you're, uh, if you're buying $1 million in ETFs, but if you're putting $1,000 to work, a $10 commission is a real cost. The second risk you can't avoid, even with zero commission programs, is spreads. The bid-ask spread is the gap between the bid, what the market is willing to buy an ETF at, and the ask, the level at which the market is willing to sell. The larger the gap, the more it will cost to trade the ETF, the same way it works with single stocks. Now, bid-ask spreads can be tiny. Many ETFs consistently trade at one penny or two penny spreads, or they can be large. It always pays to check the bid-ask spread before you buy to ensure that the market is trading reasonably tightly and that you won't be losing too much in frictional costs when you enter or exit a fund. One thing I would note here is that often, the liquidity that you see on screen when trading an ETF is not representative of the true liquidity available in that fund. If you're trading in size, it often pays to contact a liquidity provider like Knight or WalletBeth who can use that creation redemption mechanism to help process big trades in seemingly illiquid ETFs. The final risk I want to talk about on the trading side is fair value. How do you know that an ETF is trading in line with its underlying value? How do you know that that teeter-totter is flat? Fortunately, for domestically focused ETFs, you have a tool. Every ETF, by law, must publish what's called an indicative NAV, or INAV, which is an estimate of the fair value of the underlying securities. These are published every 15 seconds of the trading day. If you're on a place like Google Finance, you can get them by typing in the ticker plus dot IV, and it's a great thing to check before you're trading domestic ETFs. But for internationally focused ETFs, this falls apart. A Chinese equity fund, for instance, has underlying securities that don't trade at all during the U.S. trading day. As a result, the INAV is essentially useless. It doesn't move. For these funds, you should focus on the more liquid ETFs where there's sufficient price discovery that you can be confident that the ETF is trading in line with its true fair market value. Premiums and discounts actually become more complicated in difficult areas of the markets like bonds. Because fixed income securities do not trade in a central location like the NYSE or the NASDAQ, their pricing and liquidity is inconsistent once you get past simple treasury bills. An aggregate bond ETF like AGG may own over 700 individual issues, some of which trade every second and some of which trade every month. For those that trade less frequently, it is difficult to determine an accurate real-time price and therefore difficult to determine an end-of-day accurate NAV, much less an intraday NAV. This chart looks at MUB, one of the big municipal bond ETFs. And remember last fall when everyone thought the muni market was going to collapse? Well, the value of muni bonds fell, but MUB fell more, and it stated a discount to its underlying index for months until munis finally rallied in January. Now, it's tough to say if MUB was trading at a discount or if the index was improperly valued. The underlying bonds during this time were not really trading at all, so for the most part, bond valuation companies were making estimates of the values that created that index. It's very possible that the bond valuation people were too optimistic. It's equally possible that the crush of people exiting MUB pushed it to a discount. MUB was the most liquid way to buy and sell municipal securities at that time, but its fair value, quote unquote, was a guess. Now, fortunately, large bond ETF issuers like PIMCO and iShares mitigate some of these risks by allowing cash creations and redemptions that relieve APs from the task of having to trade and hedge the underlying bonds. These managers have big presences in the bond markets, and they can enter and exit these bonds at much lower costs, and that helps keep spreads down. While this isn't a perfect solution in a credit crunch, it does help mitigate some of these problems. We see a similar thing with premiums and discount when the equities markets freeze up. This chart compares the price of the Egypt ETF in blue with a number of Egyptian stocks that trade on the London exchange over the past few weeks, a time when the actual domestic Egyptian stock market had been closed. Now, the, once the Egyptian market was closed in late January, Vanek, the sponsor of the EGPT ETF, 
shut down all creation activity in the fund. It did this after receiving a huge influx in cash that it couldn't put to work in the local markets because they were closed. But even after the fund was closed to creations, investors kept buying EGPT because it was the best proxy perhaps in the world for accessing the underlying Egyptian market. Is it fairly valued though? We don't know. Currently, EGPT is trading at a premium of over 20% over above its underlying net assets with about 40% of its money parked in cash. So you tell me, when Egypt finally opens, are you more likely to see, see the fund close to the, to the top, which are EGPT and Sentiment, a representative Egyptian stock trading in London, or to the bottom line, which is the actual NAV of the EGPT ETF, and where another uh, Egyptian stock called Oriscom has traded since the markets closed in late January. There's just really no way to know here. Let's turn quickly to another kind of risk, counterparty risk. I'm sure some of you own ETNs, which are similar to ETFs, but rather than holding actual underlying securities, are structured as bond notes with an underwriting bank agreeing to pay the note holder a certain pattern of returns. Let's say UBS will agree to pay you a pattern of returns based on certain commodities index. Now, ETNs can be great. They have no tracking error, and they provide unique access to certain areas of the market. But they're not risk-free. Because they are credit instruments, a default by the underwriting bank will cause the value of ETNs to drop to zero, essentially. Now, this is a very low probability event, but it is something you have to keep your eye on if you're a long-term holder of these products. ETNs aren't the only product that take on counterparty risk. A number of ETFs, including leveraged and inverse funds, as well as funds like the Market Vectors China A Shares ETF, use swaps to gain exposure to the market. Now, swaps are not as risky as ETNs, not by a long shot, so it's important to understand the difference. In a swap agreement, two parties will agree to exchange a pattern of returns. Let's say a major bank agrees to provide VanEck exposure to Chinese A shares for a fee. At first, though, the two parties don't exchange any cash at all. Instead, an account is created which must be balanced based upon movements in the referenced index. For instance, if the Chinese market goes up, the swap counterparty will have to contribute cash to reflect that rise in value. If the Chinese market goes down, VanEck will chip in itself. Typically, these accounts are settled on a daily or weekly basis or whenever they move by 4 or 5 or 2 percent, making the true counterparty risk if a company goes bankrupt relatively minimal. One final area where counterparty risk creeps up is in securities lending. 53% of ETFs currently have share lending programs whereby they lend out the underlying securities in an ETF for profit. Does this layer add an extra layer of risk to a fund? Even more importantly, do you know which funds are on which side of this chart? If history is any guide, the answer to both questions is no. First, well-managed securities lending programs serve to decrease portfolio costs in direct proportion to the amount of proceeds they return to shareholders. And second, information about securities lending programs is poorly disclosed by fund companies. Now, generally, I think SEC lending programs are a net positive for shareholders. Well-managed and insane markets with sensible collateralization policies, there's no untoward risk, and there are real benefits. But again, history teaches us that new things can happen, and investors in general should push for greater disclosure of what kinds of collateral firms accept in SEC lending programs and how often they true up accounts. Now, the biggest single risk, before I bring in my, uh, my panelists, uh, the one I want to close with is selection and understanding risk in the ETF market. There are now more than 1,100 ETFs on the market. And in any given area where ETFs compete, whether that's muni bonds, biotech, emerging markets, or what have you, there are enormous differences between the funds. A lot of people don't think this is true. They assume that all ETFs are index funds and one is just as good as the other. But there have been a tremendous amount of quote-unquote innovations in the ETF and indexing space over the past few years, and indexes now differ wildly. So this is a chart of eight broad-based financial ETFs over the last 12 months. The difference between the best and worst performing fund here is 13% in one year. There are no leverage funds, no regional banking funds, no broker-dealer funds, just eight ETFs that call themselves broad-based financial ETFs, and they've generated a 13% one-year return difference. Now, if you pick the bottom, you're not terribly happy with ETFs. 
But if that chart was interesting, this one takes the cake. The last chart, at least, was easy to understand. In that case, the funds all tracked different indexes, and those differences drove the differences in returns. But what about this chart? This chart shows two ETFs that actually track the same index, the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. And over the last two years, they were over 13% apart in just two years. And things get even more complicated when you move into alternative asset classes such as commodities, leveraged products, or options-based funds. This chart compares the performance of the largest oil ETF against spot oil over the past year. And as you can see, while spot oil rose 28%, USO, the largest oil fund, rose only 6%. And this happened because the market was in contango, and that hurt the returns of commodity futures. A fund that tries to limit the impact of contango, USL, rose 17%. At other times in the market, you'll actually see futures funds outperform spot. But I think it's important to point out here, investors have to think, what am I trying to achieve here? Am I trying to buy spot oil, or am I trying to get futures exposure? And if you are trying to buy spot oil, you have to decide how to get the closest you can to that with ETFs, which means evaluating and understanding the structure of the oil futures market. Now, just so you don't think I'm cherry-picking slides, here's another slide showing what happened in natural gas. That red line at the top is spot natural gas, which closed the year down 50%. But meanwhile, the two most popular natural gas ETFs, UNG and UNL, dropped by 37 and 31% respectively. This actually gets even more complicated as you head into exotic categories like leverage and inverse funds, where you need to understand convexity and the pattern of returns and how the impact of compounding can cause your money, your investment to lose money in high volatility environments or compound positively in trending environments. So here I've shown the blue line, which is the performance of the Select Sector Spiders financial ETF over the past year. It's up about 11%. The triple bull direction fund, the black line, is up about 19%, when on a simple multiple, you'd expect it to be up 33. And the triple bear financials, the green, the, the red line at the bottom, is, uh, is down about 50%, which is much more than the 33% you might expect. Whether you were triple up or triple down, uh, you may not have gotten the long-term pattern returns you expected. And the interesting thing here is that these are all excellent products doing exactly what they claim to do, but what they claim to do is provide inverse and leverage exposure to the daily returns of their index. If you're holding for more than a day, you're going to be surprised. One last area where understanding and selection crops up is taxes. Now, people don't like to talk about taxes because they're complex, but they become tremendously important as you move away from traditional inequities and bonds and into currencies, commodities, and other alternative asset classes that ETFs now offer exposure to. ETFs, for tax purposes, are treated as pass-through entities. To the IRS, it doesn't matter if you hold an ETF. Your tax is if you hold the underlying investment. So if you've bought GLD in a client's account, no matter how long you hold that fund, you'll be taxed at a 28% rate when you sell because the IRS considers gold bullion a collectible. If you bought FXE or another currency fund, with a few exceptions, you're going to pay ordinary income rates when you sell, no matter how long you held the fund. And if you bought a commodity futures ETF, like DBC or USO, you'll be taxed as if you hold futures, meaning you'll pay 60-40 uh, long-term, short-term gains every year with no opportunity to defer. And you might even get a K-1 for your trouble. But you can buy a commodities ETN and get equity-like tax treatment. The point here is ETFs have opened up many new asset classes. They're not all treated the same from a tax basis, and you have to do your homework to understand that, or you can fall victim to it. I want to close by addressing quickly some of the attacks we've seen on ETFs recently in the media, including publications by the Kauffman Foundation, Bogan Associates, and various websites, all of which argue together that ETFs represent a systemic risk to the system. Now, so far, each of these arguments have been inherently flawed and quickly debunked. The first Bogan report failed at a basic level to understand how short selling work and therefore misinterpreted high short interest numbers as naked shorting, which they're not. The Kaufman report failed to understand how the ETF creation redemption process work and therefore uh, created some vision of systemic risk in the ETF market.
Their more recent report uh, failed to understand how the continuing net settlement process works for market makers who have by law T plus six days to settle their accounts and therefore overstated the true number of failures uh, in the market. I do expect we'll see additional tax on ETFs in the near term as ETFs are significantly eating into market share of mutual funds and stock trading and represent a competitive threat to these products. Hopefully better education will drive more informed discussions. In the end, ETFs are great tools. They offer hundreds of choices, extreme efficiency, low costs, but they are slightly more complex than mutual funds. You pay for those benefits by the complexities that you incur. Uh, I do think they're, they're great products, but there are some risks. And with that, I, I'd love to bring in my panelists, Tom and Michael from uh, ETF Trends and ETF DB, uh, for a, a few discussions. Um, I'll remind you as participants of this webinar, you can enter questions into the Q&A session for all the panelists uh, at any time. Uh, but I'm going to kick things off uh, with you, Tom. Um, what major risks do you see in the ETF market that I haven't covered in these slides? I, I can't imagine how I could add much more. Uh, you, Matt, you did a great job and it was a great presentation. Uh, but what you're keying in on really is education. I mean, the key thing is as investors and advisors are seeing the number of ETFs grow and the amount of assets that are flowing, unfortunately, uh, the education levels aren't keeping up at the same pace. So, you know, I, I think what you're doing today is great. It, it really comes down to a lot more choices than we had in the past. I mean, most of us uh, come from the mutual fund world. You know, I, I've been involved in money management for 25 years, and for clients up until about eight years ago, we used strictly mutual funds. And today, uh, having most of that money in ETFs for our clients, there are a heck of a lot more choices. But as you point out, there's more information to uh, decipher uh, with those choices. There's uh, a lot more um, opportunities for our clients. Uh, but we have to keep up, you know, not only education ourselves, educating ourselves, but also educating our clients. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Michael, I guess, what do you see as the main sort of educational gaps in the market, or what are you focusing on uh, in your writing, trying to get information about ETFs out to investors? Yeah, I think just to, you know, just to piggyback a, a little bit off of, um, off of what, what Tom said, and then I'll get into that. I think there's, you know, the biggest risk I see, I guess, is just, you know, it's difficult to measure, but it's getting in over your head. Um, and there's, you know, there's 1,100 funds out there. A lot of the assets are in, you know, plain vanilla stocks and bonds um, but that, that are relatively easy to understand. But there, as we get more and more products, there's a lot of products that are really sophisticated, really advanced. Uh, and are difficult. Some of them, honestly, I have a difficult time understanding. So, uh, you know, I think that it's important to be clear that a lot of the, the ETFs out there are not appropriate for a lot of investors. And I've heard the, the piece of advice given before, and I thought it's always something to keep in mind. If you can't understand it in five minutes, uh, you should probably walk away. It's probably not for you. Um, you know, having said that, to, to get to your question, I, I think a, a lot of confusion we see is in the commodity space, and the, the two slides you showed were pretty powerful. People get into these funds judging the, the book by its cover, the, the ETF by its name, I guess, in this case, and they think they may be getting uh, exposure to, to spot oil or to spot natural gas. Um, and, and at the end of the day, that, that's really not what they're getting, and, and that information is there. It's just a matter of, uh, a matter of, uh, of digging it up um, and, and figuring out how that, exactly how that works. Um, so I think that's, that's been one area that, that we've seen just a tremendous need for education is uh, in the commodity space, understanding uh, that these are powerful tools, but, but that they, there's some nuances to them and they, they may not always perform exactly how you might expect. So uh, to, to echo Tom, it's, uh, it's important to do your homework. Yeah, I think, I think we'd all agree on that. Um, Tom, do you, think, um, do you think investors should be allowed to buy commodity ETFs? We, we, you know, if you want to trade options or futures, you have to tick some boxes and say you're educated on them. Um, but you can buy ETFs that hold commodities and futures just by uh, going into your Schwab account. Is that, do you think there's a, there's a mismatch there? You know, I, I think we throw that question out a lot, and, and for decades, if investors want to shoot themselves in the foot, you know, they'll find a way to do that. And, uh, you know, we don't really have to look to uh, 
ETFs or, or ETPs to find products that do that. People have been doing that for years. I, I think what we, what folks like us can do is continue to try to educate um, about all the choices and how things work, but mostly if, especially with technology and communication today, I don't think investors are buying something blindly without, without, without doing their research. Um, and then after that, watching what their investments are doing. It's just very easy to be able to see what's going on. But if in the end an investor does that without doing the research and doesn't watch what's going on and gets punished, you know, maybe they deserve it. But I think the, the majority of the population shouldn't be punished or taxed or have to go through additional screening to be able to have more investment options open to them. Yeah, yeah, Matt. I, if I if I could just jump ahead, in there real real quick. quick to echo what you know what Tom said. We talked about all the advantages of of what ETFs have done: the the transparency, the lower cost, the tax efficiency. Um, another big advantage, I, I think, is you know quite honestly, they've democratized a lot of asset classes and uh, a lot of investment strategies. They've made these available to uh, you know to people who previously it, it was either too time consuming or too expensive to do. Um, so while I, you know, I certainly it's kind of a fine line because there there may be a need to uh, to a certain point protect investors from themselves, uh, but but at the same time you you don't want to wall it off to to the, the the people who know exactly what they're doing and and who are who are using these these uh, products correctly. And I agree with Tom. That's the that's the vast majority of investors are are using these exactly as they should be used. They're doing their homework and they they understand what exactly what they're getting into. Yeah, well, I, I think I agree with that. We got a question from the from the audience, which is a perfect one for you, Michael, because uh, I know you recently wrote about this. Um, make the case for me for ETNs. You know, why why would an investor choose an ETN and, and voluntarily take on that credit risk? Yeah, I think uh, you know, I, I think ETNs have have to some extent gotten a bad rap, and and I want to you know caution that by saying that that credit risk it, it can't be ignored, as as Lehman Brothers, a, a one-time issuer of ETNs, showed us. That, that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, simply on that, on the credit risk, you know, it's a, it, it's an analysis. It's a factor that should be taken into consideration. What what additional risk um, that brings into a portfolio, uh, and certainly seeing an all ETN portfolio would would make me nervous. And and any big big concentration of credit risk would make me nervous, as it should any other investor. Uh, but I think that in you know, in in tactical and in, in smaller um, amounts within a portfolio, ETNs can be a much more efficient way to, to access certain asset classes uh, and, and certain strategies. And, and you showed it, a great example in that table, is the commodity space where for a lot of investors it, it may make more sense from a tax perspective to use an ETN as opposed to an ETF that, that may offer exposure to, uh, to a very similar index. Uh, and there are a lot of other examples of that. Another one, um, it, Another interesting application is even in the Indian equity space where, where um, and this is getting off the, the tax issue a little bit, but where there, there may be some issues with liquidity of the underlying securities and tracking error may be a big deal. Um, and then back to the, to the tax issue, there's a, a couple strategies out there. We've seen uh, trend-following ETNs that, that have some advantages over trying to do it yourself. Um, and we've also seen a merger arbitrage product come out recently in the ETN wrapper that, that has the potential to, to be even more tax efficient than an ETF may be. Um, so there, the structure gets, tends to be overlooked a little bit. A lot of things get grouped under the ETF umbrella, and the term ETF uh, is sometimes used to refer to ETFs, ETNs, and, and a whole host of other securities. Um, but at the, the structural level, the, those, those distinctions have some, uh, have some very material impacts potentially on return. Uh, and there are there are both pros and cons for ETN. So I think if used correctly, they can be again very powerful tools. I, I have a I have a couple questions on on trading that I want to direct to you, uh, Tom. The, the first one says, is, is there a better time in the trading day to buy or sell shares, particularly large blocks of ETFs? Yeah, I, I think there's there's some argument for that. Um, however, on any given day you can have different market situations. I mean, we're seeing the volatility of the markets today, and, you know, some may say, hey, we need to watch towards the close and see, and see what's going to happen. On the other hand, um, as you pointed out in your presentation, Matt, you know, 
um, the liquidity is there, and more than ever, there's uh, pressure and competition in the marketplace to have good execution liquidity. And and we're seeing from the custodians that we communicate with, and we happen to have our accounts custodied at Charles Schwab, they're doing more and more to provide better liquidity. Um, also, I, I never thought I would say this, but uh, the third-party liquidity providers are also doing a great job to make the uh, landscape even that much more competitive from a liquidity standpoint. So uh, although ETFs themselves are excellent, transparent, and cost-effective uh, vehicles, trading is critical to getting all the benefits that uh, ETFs offer. And, you know, if your custodian is doing a good job, great, but there are also other options out there as well. Right. And I'll just throw in one thing on my own because we just did a study of this. There's, there's a, a myth, I think, that, you know, you take a, a fund like a European fund and it trades better in the morning when the underlying securities are, are open. Um, we, actually, we actually looked at that and did 10-minute snapshots of, of bid acts. Um, for funds where the underlying closes throughout the trading day. And it turns out, at least on the public displayed market, there is no difference, no variance in the average bid-ask spread um, for a European funds, say at 10 a.m. when the European markets are open or 3 p.m. when they're not. Now, I would imagine if you called up one of those alternate liquidity providers that, like you mentioned, Tom, and asked for a big trade in one of those funds, uh, it would be better to do it when the underlying market was open because they could Absolutely. hedge themselves more easily. Yeah, um, for sure. But for small small trades, it doesn't seem to be really a big deal. Right. Um, I guess I'll, I'll throw out this question. Um, uh, we've gotten a couple of these. Uh, it, does, a, does a high, incredibly high turnover uh, of of ETFs and you know the huge volume of ETFs managed by algorithms and high frequency shops? Does that concern you? I guess, Tom, I'll, I'll throw that out to you first and then see if Michael has anything to add on top. Well, I think those of us who have been watching the ETF market continue to applaud the asset flow and, um, and, and the liquidity that comes from that. And as, as time goes on, I mean, back five years ago when we were watching uh, new ETFs come out, which were great ideas, some of us stayed away because the flow just wasn't there, so the, the bid and ask spreads were larger than they are today. So uh, more volume tends to bring tighter spreads, and I think that's just a fact of trading. So the, the, the fact that there's greater volume and maybe bigger players in the game with you know, bigger bags of money, it hasn't, and there, or there aren't any, there isn't any evidence at this point that that has a negative effect on the markets and the, and the ETFs that represent them. Hmm. Any thoughts, Michael? Yeah, you know, I, I, I pretty much I, I agree very much with Tom. I think that, that it's been, you know, a, a generally positive development. There have been some, uh, some maybe misinformed and some unfortunate uh, categorizations of high frequency tr traders as, as bringing down the system. Um, but I, I think that, uh, you know, it's been overall, it's been good for investors. It, it has propped up the, the ETF industry as far as bringing more assets and, and allowing these funds to stick around. Uh, and it also helps to, to create liquidity in these markets. And I think I, I saw the piece, there's a, a great piece on indexuniverse.com today uh, with Burton Melkill talking about the, the positive contributions of, of high-frequency trading. Uh, and and I, I agreed with, with uh, a lot of what he said, which, which Tom kind of echoed there. Interesting, yeah. I, I think that's true as well. We have a question, maybe this is a good one for you, Michael, um, particularly about, and sorry to jump around here a bit, but we're getting a lot of great questions, um, particularly about Vanguard share class patent. Um, if you could, maybe you could help everyone on the call understand how Vanguard's ETFs operate just generally, and, and if there are any you know, special advantages or risks involved uh, with the Vanguard ETF system. Sure. Um, Vanguard is unique in that they, they have a patent on, um, on the, the share class structure. The, the ETFs are actually uh, separate shares of the, the Vanguard mutual funds. Um, and, and as far as any specific advantages, I think uh, 
um, it, it kind of man materializes or manifests itself in uh, in the expense ratio. You see that uh, Vanguard is is known for having some of the lowest expense ratios in the industry, and they've they've attracted a lot of assets uh, partially because of that. Um, so the advantage comes in that they're they're essentially managing a a much bigger pool of money than than just the the, the ETF share. Um, and that, that obviously translates into economies of scale, and it, it allows them uh, it allows them to, to offer low expenses um, across all of their share classes. Um, so you know, I, I see that as the, as the biggest advantage. Um, you know, as far as as far as some of the potential risks, um, and, and we could get you know we could get in depth here. Um, you know, there are some some nuances when it comes to the the creation redemption mechanism, and, and some people have worried that. Uh, that they may be less tax efficient because they're grouped in with the other mutual funds, um, but but having talked with a lot of folks at, at at Vanguard, that really isn't the case. They 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 plan that very carefully, and, and in some sense, having those, those deeper pockets uh, allows them to uh, to be more tax efficient. So um, it's a it's a very unique structure, and it, it, it the, the primary benefit is is the lower costs. I would guess. Tom, I'm going to flip that on its head for you and take the other end of the spectrum. Are there any special risks or concerns you have as an advisor buying ETFs from small sort of startup ETF companies? Uh, does that raise any concerns on your part? Well, what it really comes down to, you know, a couple things, Matt. It's uh, if you're buying a thinly sliced sector or, or asset class, uh, you, you automatically are putting yourself in a situation where there could be more volatility, whether it's backed by a big name uh, with a lot of money or if it's a, a new uh, ETF provider with a small amount of money. Um, in the end, it really comes down to um, is that something that you want to have in your portfolio and can you buy that effectively? You know, if if you're going to go in and pay some type of premium or the spread is large, it may not be the right thing to do. And however, I'll tell you, and it's a great question because I think there are many investors today who have lived through the last 10 years. They realize that maybe buy and hold hasn't worked for them, and they're seeing opportunities and asset classes that they never imagined before. And uh, you know, frankly, are getting quite excited. So kind of as, as Michael had mentioned, you know, I think there's probably some concern with too many choices out there. There's some concern with some of these new ETF providers getting into very thinly sliced sectors. But in the end, if you do your homework, um, you'll find that they can be as liquid as some of these larger ETFs. And um, as a fan of ETFs in general, I love seeing the competition. Yep, absolutely. I agree. I'm actually going to take a question here um, uh, because I think it, it may be addressed to me. But the question was, can you expand more on the Hogan White Paper and what was wrong about the assumptions on high short interest in ETFs? And I wanted to comment first because it's, it's, it's the Bogan White Paper, and, and I don't want it uh, confused with my own name uh, since I disagree with every word in it. Um, so all we share is the Ogan in our names. Uh, as far as what was wrong with it, so, so Bogan's main assertion was he looked at ETFs that had, say, 200 or 300 percent short interest, and he had two concerns. And the first was that, you know, there must be naked shorting. More than 100 percent of the shares are sold short. And that, that's just, you know, a basic misunderstanding of how shorts work. You know, if, if, uh, if I have shares and I lend them to you and you sell them, then the fund is 100% short. Now, you sold those shares to somebody, so what if they take them and lend them to someone else who sells them? Well, then the fund is 200% short, right? So it's, it's not actually the case that funds or stocks can't be more than 100% short. It does indicate high short interest, but there's nothing illegal or wrong about it. Uh, the second thing that Bogan got wrong was he was concerned that, you know, an ETF could disappear in a giant poof if, say, 300% of its short shares were sold short and everyone with those shares, uh, you know, redeemed for the underlying securities and you'd have more claims on the underlying securities um, than there were underlying securities. And, and that falls apart on two points. Uh, the first is that, 
uh, there's only one person in the chain of that short selling who knows that he hasn't lent out the securities, and that's the last person in that chain. Right? Anyone else in that chain knows that they have lent out the securities and they don't actually hold the rights to them, so they can't present them for redemption. So practically speaking, it can't happen. And, and the second bit is every, little, every ETF prospectus has a little line in it saying when there is high short interest, the ETF company can force you to prove that you are the beneficial owner of the shares before honoring a redemption request. Usually there's a circuit breaker at 25 or 50 percent short interest. Um, so there's also legal protections to prevent ETFs from disappearing. So I, I, think, I think Bogan just got them wrong right there. Um, I guess, I guess I'll, go, I'll go to you, Tom, again. We got another question on securities lending. We have time for probably one or two more questions. What do you think about securities lending by ETF companies? Do you consider it a net positive, uh, a net negative? Does it concern you? Does it keep you up at night? Uh, or is it just not an issue? Well, securities lending has been around for a long time, and uh, I, I think there uh, more ETF providers are looking at it more closely. Uh, I, I think one thing that's interesting is uh, Schwab, Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, who are big custodians of mutual fund assets, uh, are also the biggest custodians of ETF assets. And they can't lend on mutual fund shares that are held within their accounts, but they can lend on ETFs. So I think we're going to see more of that, and it's going to be in a very positive way. We're starting to see lower and lower expense ratios in ETFs. We're also starting to see lower and lower trading costs at the big brokerage companies, and he's even no transaction fees. But I think with income that can be derived from securities lending by the big brokerage companies that we eventually will see no transaction fee marketplaces um, at the big brokerage companies like Schwab, Fidelity, and TD. And then in the end, who benefits from that? It's the average investor. I think that's I think that's a great point. I mean, I think that's a great point. It's hugely valuable and, and run properly, uh, whether it's the lending of the ETF shares, as you suggest, or lending of securities within the portfolio. Um, I think it makes sense. Um, so that, that was a great answer. Uh, let me let me give the last question to Michael, and we got a question on tracking error. So I, I showed the classic slide of EEM versus VWO tracking error, and I guess this uh, the question points to you know what creates tracking error in a fund, and how can investors sort of adequately assess the risk of future tracking error? You know, what should they look at? What should they be concerned about? How much is tracking error an issue? Um, Michael, any thoughts on tracking error? Yes, certainly. And there are, you know, there are really a few different sources. That, you know, the simplest um, and, and probably the easiest to do something about is the expense ratio. Um, but, you know, an ETF, if it, if it does its job perfectly, it will still underperform the index by the expense ratio. Um, so when you, you know, you had the comparison of, of EEM and, and VWO out there, that's a great example of two similar products that have a pretty huge difference in expense ratio. I think it's 22 basis points versus 69 basis points. Um, you know, there are, the other big distinction is, is some funds will do uh, full replication where they hold every single security in the index. Um, in the in the exact proportion uh, as the underlying index, uh, and that obviously will reduce tracking error. Whereas others will do a sampling strategy. Well, they'll they'll take just a, uh, exactly what it sounds like a sampling of the underlying holdings in an effort to um, you know maybe to to reduce costs or to avoid illiquid names um, to come up with a, a subset of that portfolio that should move in unison with uh, with the underlying um, securities. Um, so, so that's pretty easy to, you know, to gauge too. There's, there's generally language in the prospectus that, that funds may uh, implement sampling strategies. You can also just do a quick comparison of the number of holdings in the underlying index and, and the number of holdings in the ETF. And if there's a big discrepancy there, um, you realize that they're, that they're doing sampling and there's a potential for tracking error, uh, which could end up being it could end up being good. It could end up being bad. Um, meaning it could end up being a, a positive for investors. It could be a negative. 
Um, and, and then the last is, is, I guess, more structural in nature. The last that I'll touch on here is just that you know, simply indexes are the, these hypothetical constructions, and it's just the, uh, the flip of a switch um, to, to add a new name or to, to take out a name, uh, whereas the, the ETF actually has to go out and has to, has to buy the underlying securities. Uh, so it's a lot easier for the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average to, to essentially flip that switch and, and shuffle the components. Um, and, and an index, uh, an ETF manager has to go out and, and do some buying and selling and, and reconstruct the portfolio. Um, and, and, you know, we've seen that a little bit of, of that can be difficult, just how, how big the indexed, uh, index mutual fund and ETF space has gotten. Uh, index reconstitutions can, can trigger a lot of buying and selling. Um, and, and that can result in, you know, not only commissions, but in uh, getting in a little behind the curve or a little ahead of the curve can have an impact on the tracking error. Um, you know, it, it's tough to, to actively do anything about that last component, I guess. It's just kind of a, like I said, part of the, the structural nature of, uh, of passive indexing. But um, certainly, you know, it, it shows up in the, in the tracking error, and the total tracking error is kind of a reflection of the, the manager's ability to, uh, to stay on top of those and to efficiently execute those trades. That was, a, that was a great answer. Well, uh, we've run out of time, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, my panelists, Tom Leiden of ETF Trends and Michael Johnston of ETFDB. Encourage you to check out their own websites. As a participant on this webinar and, and an audience member, we'll send you an email uh, with all the information you need for continuing education credits, as well as a link to the slides and a replay of the audio of this webinar so you can listen to it again and again. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll join us for the next in the continuing series of Index Universe webinars available on indexuniverse.com. Just look for the events and webinar tab. Uh, thank you for joining me, and thanks to my panelists. Everyone have a great afternoon.